thank you for fitting this in. I know uh, it's a busy time. Um, this, this bill came about when a uh, constituent um, discovered that the, she, she's on the school board and she, their town treasurer is retiring. She's assistant treasurer. And she wanted to run for town treasurer. Discovered that those are incompatible offices, um, which I think historically is appropriate. But the school structure, with Act 46, the school structure has changed such that it's an independent union school with a totally independent financial office, outside auditors, and no longer has that close connection that schools traditionally have with their towns. Um, so I believe that, that this is a, an outdated incompatibility. Um, and this is the only one that I'm addressing in this bill. It could be that the whole concept needs to be reevaluated, updated. Um, but my request is, is merely to uh, remove this incompatibility. And partly in light of, I think we all have experiences with getting people, the difficulty of getting people to run for a municipal office. Um, and so I don't think we should throw out further roadblocks when they're not necessary. Uh, I did speak with uh, Karen Horn about this. And uh, I mean, to be honest, I had to remind her several times. And I think it was not high on her agenda. And then her response was, um, we, in general, we oppose it. Oh. Oppose it. Uh, without really looking at it, and I think it was a, you know, a super abundance of caution and the sort of if it ain't broke, don't fix it response, but I would argue that it is broke. Jim? But uh, I'm trying to understand. So mm -hmm. you're talking about the town <coughs> auditor or treasurer? Town treasurer. Okay, versus yeah. school director, which is totally, totally separate. Correct. Okay, I guess I'm trying to understand the conflict. Um, exactly. you know, if, 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 if it was all in one, one I, I mean, a school director and a school treasurer, I get it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm just, I'm, I so, may be missing something. So, so I, I think it's historically when it was a village school and the, um, and the finances were also handled within the village, potentially town treasurer could write it, could cut a check to the school and, have to, and it could be handled by a spouse or even that person. Um, but now there's a... And, and I got that. Now, and prior to Act 60, it was all local and um, right. today maybe there are places where it's set up differently, but I think yeah. for virtually everyone I'm aware of, the school district is a separate right. entity. So, so I, my, my belief is that the LCT's opposition was somewhat reflexive rather than really a considered review of the, the situation. No. Yeah, well, in my town, it basically the treasurer holds both positions of the school treasurer plus the town treasurer. And a lot of times people mistake that as being a single treasurer for both, for the whole. When in reality they wear two different hats, but the treasurers of the, the school district and uh, of the town, and they do basically work for the school and do the treasury work for that, and then they do it for the town. Mm -hmm. and I just don't. Uh, I agree with you. I think it's it's antiquated because of all the mess that we've now under the Right. Forty six, and it needs to be changed because you can't get anybody to run for anything these days. Thank you. <laughs> Warren and then Jim. Some of this may not be very ancient history because <coughs> it, it was only last biennium that we dealt with uh, the happenings up in Coventry. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that really was the impetus for making a lot of these offices incompatible. Uh, whether whether this, this does seem so separate that you wonder why the law prohibits it, uh, but I'm just saying that some of, some of it's fairly new and, and we may not have gotten it entirely right when we looked at that. This, this looks like something that we should look at. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry Karen had the reflex that she had, but she'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly you'll want to hear from 
poker. Yeah. Thank you. Jim? More of a question of process, uh, if, if I may. Sure. But, um, I think we have a miscellaneous elections bill coming over from the Senate. I don't know if this fits within that, if we wanted to take testimony and amend it on to that. I mean, I, we need to learn more um, about any potential conflicts. Um, but. Boy, I don't want to. I don't want to be the one that puts up any more barriers to finding people to run for office. I know in the case of our town, you know, we're pleading. Could someone please come in for an appointment to be auditor? I mean, we just, you know, we don't want to put more barriers. If they need to be there, then by golly, we got to avoid conflict uh, or potential problems. But, uh, we also have the town agent. Oh, sorry. <coughs> that could be a conversation. Yeah. From the Senate? No, it's a House bill. We um, introduced it last week of uh, eliminating, um, moving town agent from an elected position to an appointed position. Right, and I'm thinking of a crossover issue, that's all. Yeah, you're right. We could put both on the miscellaneous mm -hmm. right, bill, perhaps. But the Senate bill was yesterday. We did? Okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Well, thank you very okay. much, Rob. Thank you for your time, and, and you. certainly if you do have any questions where I can help, feel free. Let's Are you in the basketball? I'm not. Oh, okay. Good for you. <laughs> in, in, in the eighth grade, I went out for the basketball team, and since then I've tried to avoid any remote connection with basketball. So it's such a humiliating experience. I just wanted an opportunity to ask the question of who is in second place. <laughs> Morning. Morning. We're moving on without the yes. chair. Okay. So, you got you all, the committee has asked me to come in and speak to the proposed charter change in Montpelier that would allow for uh, non citizens to vote in their local elections. And that might be disappointing to you all this morning because I think I'm going to be fairly boring and brief. <laughs> um, like normal. Jeez. Exactly. Oh. Oh. Well, he opened the door. Just try to stay away. <laughs> Just try to stay away. Okay. It won't be that hard. Go for it. Um, from a policy standpoint, from a, a broad perspective, um, I spoke with the secretary this morning. Of course, I've talked with him um, since this proposal came out too, and. Um, he pretty strongly feels that this is a decision to be made at the local level and is remaining neutral at this point on um, the concept of non-citizen voting. Um, obviously it's clear to us, to him, that non-citizens are not qualified to vote in state or federal elections. Um, we see that as extremely clear in both constitutions at the state and federal level. Um, but we see no indication in this proposal that there's any suggestion that they would. Um, the proposal is pretty clearly written to only allow for the non-citizens to take part in the local Montpelier elections. Um, and as such, the secretary really feels that it's a decision for the, the locality and the legislature via the charter process. Um, and I assume, and that what I was going to lean over and ask Fletch Council Rask was whether you all then provided the opinion on the constitutionality of the yeah. proposal yet. Yeah. Yeah. Betsy yeah. has walked us through the yeah. constitutionality issues. Yeah. Um, I just forgot that it happened yet. With, with respect um, to this issue and the issue of 16 and 17 year olds. Yeah. Jim? So um, most of us um, consider JPs in a local elected office. But my understanding is because it's in the Constitution, um, we can't change the voting requirements for them. That's my um, understanding also. Now, even though they're local elected, they, I think, if I remember last fall, they were on the general election ballot. So what kind of issues and costs would that um, mean for your office in terms of separating those ballots? I don't see any issues or costs for our office, um, in my mind. So those, you're correct. Well, it varies town to town. 
Okay. Some towns print their Justice of the Peace candidates on the back of the general election ballot. Okay. Some <laughs> print their own. Who, who, who prints them? The, the town or, or is it your if office? They're put on the state office with yeah. the state candidates, our office. Okay. Prints them and provides them to the towns. Okay, so the town would have to do a separate ballot and couldn't put them on the general election ballot, right? Yes, that would be my advice to the city clerk um, if this proposal were to pass. Okay. Then I think it would be potentially a separate legal question whether those local non citizen voters could vote that JP ballot or not. And I'm looking at Betsy and she's shaking her head, and that was my understanding that they could. And so if that's the, the clear case. Yeah. Um, Montpelier could probably still print them on the back of the general election ballot because then only those non-citizen voters would be receiving that ballot. Okay. Rob, Rob, so along with that thought process, well, so would that mean that these folks would have to be on their own separate voter checklist? Correct. And then that's how it's written. And how would you go about developing that? At I mean, would you have to have a separate voter checklist for every single municipality or, or town that, say, if, if other communities decided to do this? That's a good question. <coughs> Under this proposal, particular to Montpelier, it, it's written in such a way that that's totally the responsibility of Montpelier and the city clerk. And in speaking with him, it's, I know that that's his intention. And I'm happy that it's, it's really clearly set out that way in the charter also. One by one, if towns were to do so, that would be the approach that I would prefer, would be that it's the town's responsibility to keep a completely independent, separate local checklist that's separate from my system, which is what Montpelier intends to do, so that no non-citizens are ever included in the statewide voter database. If it were to pass in a way that applied to all towns, I would probably at that point consider whether we develop in our software a separate local checklist feature that could include these people, but I wouldn't take that step until the legislature decided that they wanted to do this statewide. Thank you. Well, we had preliminary like Discussions on either that or the 16, 17 year olds, and, and including it in a statewide. Is that inappropriate from your. No, that's doable. That would be, that's essentially a matter of changing the parameters on what dates get accepted when the system is assessing age by a birth date. Hmm. And then any other town charter that wanted to include it would not need to go through here to do so. The other town maybe. <coughs> that wanted to include non-citizens? Or 16, 17 year olds. I think every town would have Depending to be an charter. Instructed, it would either be automatic or subject to only local vote. Yes. The 16 and 17 year old proposal is for statewide, for an amendment to state law. Yeah. This is particularly popular. We also have a, a Brattleboro Charter Amendment, which would just go to 16 and 17 years. Vote, uh, 16, vote. Yeah, voting in local elections there. Yeah, um, so, Will, um, would this supplemental voter registry be protected under the, the voter checklist protections we put in place last year? Because, I mean, one of the concerns I have is all of a sudden we're creating a list of non-citizens um, uh, and I would not want that to get used um, in an inappropriate manner. Yes, I've thought about that as well and I believe and we can potentially wrap in Ledge Council here as well but I read the language on uh, page 2 line 12 starting there to address that issue where it says the supplemental voter registry shall be treated and maintained in the same manner as a voter checklist under <coughs> 70 BSA 43 sub 2. 
I believe that that includes the language about who can have access to the checklist, although that section seems to me to be pretty particularly directed at the statewide voter checklist. So it's not clear to me whether this local monthly list would have those same protections or not. Okay. And so it seems as if no is the answer. It would not. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Warren and uh, the, the very first uh, line on line four, page two, it says, a uh, <laughs> person may register to vote in Montpelier who on election day is a legal resident of the United States. So this, that fact alone would give them, I would hope, adequate protection from ICE, as a for instance. Uh, because if they're a legal resident, they're a legal resident. Out of my pay grade. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Me too. But yeah. you know, I mean, I, won't, I I would assume that a person who is a legal resident can prove that they are a legal resident. One would hope. And in order to register them under this scheme, I think they'd have to. I do know what it's what Representative Gannon is getting at. But there's there's significant concern among the non-citizen community and immigrant community about access to. Mm -hmm. Lists. In, yeah, in many I, I understand their concern, yeah. but ultimately, of course, they have a choice as to whether they want to register under this. That's true. So I see three different protections: so the choice of do I want to register for this; second, can I prove that I am legal; and third, am I protected by the uh, the, the one that you mentioned and how the checklist will be treated? There's a dreamer, Stewart. Stewart is someplace now that doesn't have that shared opinion. Um, Did, didn't we have conversations with somebody, either here or maybe in my head, that led us to believe that the statewide list is protected, but individual town lists can still be gone after and are not protected? Betsy Ann has an answer yes. that. Yeah, Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council, and it's uh, just what you were saying, Representative Cooper. I think that protection in the statewide voter checklist, it's in 17 DSA 2154 uh, C, is that it's the whole statewide voter mm -hmm. checklist that's protected by last biennium's act um, so that the whole voter checklist can't be given to the federal government or a foreign government. But individual town checklists are not part of that protection. A person may still obtain an individual town checklist. Those have to get posted, for example, at the town clerk's offices. So those still are public documents and are not protected by the act that was passed last by any. I agree with that. I think you, you also would get into a situation, arguably, where <laughs> Because before this provision and the, the notion that this charter puts out there of a separate supplemental local checklist, that's a kind of new creation by this language, right? That language to me was referring to that town's portion of the statewide voter checklist, because that's all, that's the only voter checklist they have. They go into the system and say, run my town names that are a subset of the larger statewide checklist. So it may come down to an, an issue of how the request is phrased and that somebody would have to know to be particular in their request that I want your supplemental local Montpelier checklist and I don't know whether but there may be an argument that that's not covered at all by this provision any of the protections in this provision since it's a totally separate entity from the statewide list it's not a portion of the statewide list it's a separate checklist John. Yeah, I mean, just to get back to Moore's question, I mean, I mean, they may be legal residents, but but there are many instances of ICE yeah. going after people and detaining them who are legal residents, yeah. um, who then you know lose many of their due process rights um, once they're in ICE detention. So we need to be careful here yeah. um, because we don't want to provide a list of people um, for ICE to go after. <coughs> Yeah. Even if they are illegal. Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, and maybe there's 2020. a way to address that. We address that in 2020. <laughs> Moreover, I think, I'm not sure if Betsy, 
Metzian was making this distinction or not, too, if you remember when we were working on this, that C, sub C there in 2154, is about, uh, requires a person to sign an affidavit to get the whole statewide checklist. And we consciously decided that that affidavit requirement wouldn't occur at the town level. But the, but the prohibition on the town official giving it to a federal agency does apply to the individual town checklist. That's in B2. Um, it's a kind of minor distinction, but there is there is still that protection, again, for the town's portion of the statewide checklist that directs the public agency not to provide it to any federal agency. How and then, Jim? So, well, do we know how other states handle this, in particular Maryland, which has a number of towns and cities that allows non-citizen voting? I don't specifically. I would assume that they are handling it in much the same way. It's a completely separate, separate beast. Sure. So, no, I guess my only question, I mean, one way or another, whether there's a prohibition on sharing with the feds or not, it, it's a public list. So whether you took the state list and cross-checked it with the town list, you're still going to identify, be able to identify the non-citizen <coughs> list. I think so. That, I mean, it makes sense to me that you would get, you could get both and do a comparison. Betsy Ann. Thank you. Oh, just going to point out for the director, um, for example, 17 BSC 2141A is the requirement for a town clerk to post at least 30 days before any local election um, copies of the voter checklist in a couple of different places in the town. So that that, that seems that um, all voters in a local election, including the non-citizen voters under this bill, will have their names posted. Are going to be posted, yeah. without a doubt. The question I have is, you talked about the, it's the state election and the local election for town. You have to have two checklists? Yes. It, does both of these checklists get posted, and do they get posted separately or together? Well, until this bill, they were the same thing. And so I think just one gets posted generally in the lead up to the election. Then it's, it's been actually a learning process since I've been director over the last four or five years to train the towns that really, even though they're being held on the same day, they're two separate elections, a local and a statewide one. They're worn separately. They really should be administered separately just at the same place on the same day. Um, some clerks actually print out two physical lists and have one place to check in for the local ballot and one place for the statewide ballot. Others will do a single printout with two columns indicating which ballot each person took. <coughs> The way I try to explain it to them is the person could come in and choose to vote in one but not the other election. And when you're doing a participation report, a turnout report for that election, you want that distinction to show. And that's why I like to see if they're holding the same one on the same two elections on the same day, one local and one state, for them to have two lists, be it two columns or two physical lists. And this, the, this would, of course, even further necessitate that since there's they're different ways. So I'm not familiar with ever having read this, but from your discussion, this is a bar for transfer of the information to federal request. Is that yes. Does that then cover Kushner Incorporated, a private agency working on contracts in the government to come and make a request and be granted, or is it a bigger blanket than if it's just federal, the federal government, most of the federal government these days is formed up to some private agency. There's a prohibition, if I remember right, also on transferring it to any uh, federal agency. So you wouldn't transfer the list, you just transfer the people that so Kushner Inc. picked up. Kushner Inc. and your hypothetical could request it, but they'd sign an affidavit saying they're not going to provide it to any federal agency. Okay. Can we take a look at the statute? Would it help? Kind of Does that help? Oh, yes. Can I have the statute? Sure. Pull it up real quick. So that the members who weren't here last uh, session can take a look at it. I think I don't think the secretary would mind me saying it's 
a goal of mine, I will just tell the committee mm -hmm. to do further work on the issue of access to the statewide checklist. I still think that uh, it, there should be more conditions and more restrictions on who can have access to that list and how. Oh, we actually call that out too. So not only the transfer provision, but it says or independent contractor from a public agency. So they wouldn't be able to get it in the first place. Although that's about who's providing it, shall not knowingly disclose. That's saying an independent contractor of, of oh, us right. wouldn't provide it. Sorry about that. Yeah. To any foreign government or to a federal agency or commission or person acting on behalf of <coughs> such federal entity. And then you see under C where they have to sign an affidavit, but it's clear that language C when any person wishing to obtain a copy of all of the statewide voter checklist from my office must sign that affidavit. The new language is um, under Big B. We've always had the commercial purpose restriction, and the federal agency was the bill that passed, was it last year? Two years ago, last year. It's a small pin head to be dancing on. It is. Will, could you, could you play out for us how this would look, say, if you had a non-resident that wanted to do same-day voter registration? What that would potentially look like? I think their request, their application, they would still be allowed to. They're, they're working under the same deadlines and process that everyone else is, is my understanding. Um, so it would be a matter of the presiding officer, typically the clerk, and the BCA members present evaluating the eligibility of the person as filled out on the application. I don't think there are any provisions in this bill about the application process for non-citizens. If, for instance, any additional documentation that would be required. So it's my understanding they fill out the form like everyone else does. Legislative Council um, in section 1502, which is on page two, um, the line 14 sentence, the city clerk shall develop all necessary forms and procedures for implementation of the industry. <coughs> so those procedures would be developed by the clerk. And I suppose that would involve a new registration form that included the questions about legal residency. Yes. <laughs> and it'd be a situation where you either check the citizen box or that box. And if you can do either, you're at it. <clears throat> Other questions for Will? Anything else you'd like to flag for us on this? I don't think so. Okay. Excellent job. It wasn't boring. <laughs> <laughs> I told him it was good. Low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I appreciate it. A little, a little bit of time here, um, so I would open it up for discussion on the bill introduction that you heard at 8:45. Incompatible <laughs> local offices. Mike. 
Wow. I'm not as well versed as, as some others might be in, in this. But it certainly seems like as times are changing and uh, for some towns it gets harder to find people to fill all the positions that this might be something we look, could look at, especially if it could help increase uh, getting more people to, to run for local offices. Concerns about that, Jim? No, I mean, um, Robin had mentioned that League of Cities and Towns might have some concerns. I mean, obviously we'd like to hear them, but I agree with uh, Mike that we need to, is, if there's not a real conflict today, and as I said before, I don't know many school districts that are part of the town, they're separate. Um, I don't think we need to put up barriers from people who are willing to have multiple offices in town. Absolutely great, as long as there's you know, not a conflict there. We have any idea how many how many uh, towns uh, actually hire an auditor, auditor auditor firm, I should say, to do all the work. The LCT might have the answer to that. Yeah. Just just curious as to I, I, on the school side, I, I would think the superintendents association or the yeah. I mean most of those organizations are pretty good size, and I I suspect is most, if not all, have outside auditors today. And it's usually part of the town report each year. Right. So the auditors report. Nelson? Well, your town elected auditors are re responsible for the town report right. and the audit. But usually, most towns will have auditors that do, but they all, in most cases, they, once every three years or every year, they'll have an outside audit firm do the yeah. town books. But the schools, it, because of the sizes today, they have an audit just about every year. Yeah, right. It's started as part of the process because they buy them for what they have to handle. Yeah. Real money, too. Yeah. 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 JP? But, but does the law require a town to have an elected auditor if they use a private auditor auditor firm? Or is it optional to have an elected auditor? Who knows the answer to that? That's the answer looking at it. <laughs> Nelson? Yeah, in the statute. Uh, it's clear in this statute from where I see from an auditor they have to do the town report. If you don't have a town auditor, who does the town report for you? Who does that piece? That's the, where I would see in my town anyways is the kind of Uh, Betsy and Rass, Election Council in the local elections chapter. Every town is required to elect an auditor unless they have voted to eliminate that office and in its place uh, hire, let's see, it's 17 BSA 2651B. If they do, if a town does vote to eliminate the office of auditor, um, then they would need to appoint a public accountant. They have to contract with a public accountant license in the state to perform an annual financial audit of all funds of the town. And that's exactly my understanding. I just wanted to, wanted to confirm it. Because that's what we do in my town. And, and the auditor and firm prepares the report, the report, and of course that goes to the town report as well. Thank you, Betsy. Okay. <clears throat> So if there's interest in moving 378, we should ask for some testimony from um, VLCT and uh, with respect to school districts, maybe the Superintendents Association. Does that make sense? Jim? So my question earlier was if we were interested in pursuing this bill, um, could we consider amending it onto the miscellaneous elections bill that came over from the Senate, or is coming over. I don't know if we have it. came over yesterday. Okay. So as to, to keep it moving this year? If, if we collectively 
we're interested in doing it. I don't know how much. It doesn't sound like it's a difficult issue. <coughs> um, obviously, you need some testimony, but if it can be done expediently, it may be right for doing that. Makes perfect sense. Let's uh, let's get that additional testimony and and see where we are. Anything else on three seventy eight? Excellent. Uh, so, what uh, what more would you like in the way of testimony on the Montpelier non citizen voting charter? <laughs> Warren? Hi. Uh, of course, I'm a sponsor of the bill. <laughs> I'd be ready to vote on this now. Um, I think we've had <laughs> adequate testimony. It seems, it seems to me like there are two underlying issues here, one having to do with constitutionality. Uh, and as much as I respect Betsy Ann's abilities and recommendations, we also have the Vermont Law School professor who so absolutely no issue to constitutionality. So you know, two respected voices in opposition, and I'm not sure that we'll ever figure it out until somebody challenges it in court. And the other issue is to what extent are we putting some people who might register under this scheme at risk from immigration officials or However, you know, it's the, the whole checklist issue. And again, I don't think we'll know that until, until we try. But my fundamental underlying thing is this passed Montpelier by a good solid two to one margin. You know, the, the voters of Montpelier clearly wanted this. This was not an issue that was decided by 100 votes. It was double. Uh, and that's pretty good, pretty good uh, Pretty solid vote. Betsy Ann? Um, just to reconfirm my testimony um, of February 28th, um, to summarize, the short answer was that Office of Legislative Council can't say with absolute certainty that this is constitutional because we don't have case law adjudicating this question under current voting qualification standards. Mm -hmm. But I reviewed with this committee that there's been at least three Vermont Supreme Court cases that have indicated that the question of voting qualifications is a matter of legislative control, not constitutional control. So to reconfirm, it appears from that case law that this is a policy question, not a constitutional question, and it's up for the General Assembly to decide. Jim? Um, I understand the access of information and potentially in an indirect way being a potential issue with ICE. But I keep coming back. These are legal residents. So if that's the case, there shouldn't be anybody on the list that is an illegal immigrant. Right. Am I correct? Or am right. I missing right. something? You're, you're, you're right. So, I mean, I have, if we go down this path, you have to assume that everyone's following the law and that the only ones people are on here are legal, um, legal residents non-U.S. citizens, and it, that part of it shouldn't matter to to the bill, I mean, or to, to disclosure to any third-party agencies. Uh, it just should, it, that shouldn't matter to me, so, unless I'm missing something. Bob? I agree with Warren. I think we've heard enough. However, I don't think that the legal resident thing is as cast in concrete as it may have been a while ago. Um, I, I think we have a tendency to think of people who have just sort of come into town and decided they're going to live here. But my next door, two doors down neighbor has been here 35 years, has two kids, works, and yada yada, and she just wants to vote on her school budget. Um, I think that wouldn't be able to do that unless do it. Yeah, it's <laughs> completely appropriate. So I'm comfortable moving forward. They, they, I mean, the dreamers think they're here legally too, but yeah, yeah. yeah. 
<clears throat> I mean, my only concern is making sure that, that we have adequate protection for this supplemental checklist. Uh, I mean, I just want to make sure that we've done our homework in that area. Um, and, it, and it might be good just to check in with, the, I think it's Tacoma Park in Maryland, and, and see what they have done, if anything, with respect to this issue. Um, they're a lot closer to D.C. than, than we are. Um, and so th they may have some helpful or useful information for us. Uh, I mean, I, I, I totally support this. It's it just I, I don't want to cause anyone to get in trouble um, uh, with ICE. And, and there are plenty of stories out there about ICE nabbing legal residents. So it, it is not a non-issue and I just want to make sure we're not putting anybody in harm's way but I think you know that we could put protections into this bill um, that would protect the people that are on the list mm -hmm. I just want to make sure we do our homework there yeah. Warren and then Bob. we don't exactly know how many people this may affect uh, at first, I know that it was being talked about around the city as well, maybe 12 to 15 people. And I think there's a reasonably good chance that it may be substantially more. It could double that number, could potentially triple that number, but still it's a small number. Uh, I was very swayed by the woman who testified who is the Norwegian mm -hmm. citizen, married an American guy, moved over here. You know, she's been here for, what, 40 years, did she say? A very, a very long time. And she'd like to be able to do this, but there's something inside her that's just so proud of her Norwegian <laughs> heritage that she can't give up her Norwegian citizenship. And so it's a, it's a real conflict, an emotional conflict for her when every time <coughs> she can't go to the polls. And, uh, and she's a, a wonderful addition to our town, I'm sure. I see no problem in allowing her to register and vote in those small number of local elections that she'd be allowed to vote on. And she's the, she's the person who, to me, represents the people that I want to advocate in, in favor of allowing this to happen. She's the example I would use. Uh, I know there are more like her. Uh, without naming any names, I know of <coughs> one fortunate couple who, when they immigrated here, the citizenship from their home country should have evaporated, but somehow in the exchange of paperwork, it didn't. And they now hold two passports, and their native country passport is probably illegal if that ever got caught. Uh, therefore, they didn't want to come testify. <laughs> but uh, you know, if, if this Norwegian woman's husband had moved with her to Norway, he could have gained Norwegian citizenship, and he could have held dual citizenship. And I'm just really sorry that the United States doesn't allow dual citizenship. I have two nieces who did hold dual citizenship, US and Canada. They were both born in Canada. And they had until, I forget when, their 25th or 30th birthday to make up their mind which one they wanted to keep. I'm not really sure, but I think both of them decided to keep their American citizenship rather than their Canadian. But that was a conflict for them. And I, I, you know, I don't see any problem with this small number of people holding dual citizenship. Bob? Um, but since this is not a constitutionally protected but a matter of policy, is it indeed then a matter that would fall under the same restrictions that a legitimate constitutionally protected statewide voter, voter checklist requirement would fall under? And is there any way, since this is basically a town-driven uh, uh, item, that we could place restrictions upon it that supersede yeah. anything that falls over the statewide checklist and still not run afoul of disclosure or anything else. Madam Chair, is it okay if I reproject that? Yes, that's you. Drop it, thanks. A yes or no would be okay. Well, no. I don't <laughs> <laughs> 
just to go over, this is the statewide voter checklist statute again. Um, so I, as the director of elections had pointed out, under this B2, it um, says that a public agency, which is all encompassing, you know, include a town clerk's office, shall not knowingly disclose a copy of all of the statewide voter checklist, which is the whole thing, or a municipality's portion of the statewide voter checklist um, to a foreign government or a federal agency. But um, the, if sorry, I might. Mm -hmm. So we have not breached the statewide voter checklist mm -hmm. at this point. We're not down into the weeds of the 1617 or resident alien population. <clears throat> Well, so correct. at this, under current law, correct, yeah. but if the Montpelier Charter were to be enacted in the law or the 418 were to be enacted in the law that allows 16 and 17 year olds to vote uh, statewide in local elections, those voters would be placed on a municipality's <coughs> local voter checklist because they would be entitled to vote in a local election. So it's this language here and I would uh, defer to the director on how this might be administered in practice or how his office would um, direct town clerks to administer this law in practice. Um, does it make sense that a town clerk could not give its own municipal checklist to a federal government or a federal uh, or foreign government under this law? Or that's what I was saying isn't clear to me right now. So this morning is the first time I considered that distinction. But if some, if a requester were to say, I want Montpelier's portion of the mm -hmm. statewide voter checklist, like that language, mm -hmm. I would tell John to run the Montpelier portion of the statewide voter checklist that didn't include the non-citizens. But I don't see where there's a distinction. Well, right under the now, charter, it says any non-citizen voter shall be placed on a separate supplemental voter registry. I, I, I don't know whether somebody mm -hmm. would consider that Montpelier's portion of the statewide voter checklist mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not statewide if it's, it's local. Right. Yeah, it's it local. never gets delivered to local state. By right, but this refers to a portion. So in other towns, if a request is made pursuant to this, I have them run mm -hmm. their portion of the but, checklist. But it's a portion of a different pie, isn't it? Yes. We're talking about a cupcake that the city maintains itself, not the buy that the state. That's the question. But, but I, with the way it's written, I would lean towards saying that this separate supplemental checklist isn't covered by those provisions. Mm -hmm. JP, and then did you? Oh, that might be. Oh, okay. Jim. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead, Jim. Um, do, is Montpelier? part of any union school district? Yes. Uh, we are in a union school district with the town of Roxbury, and that means that people who registered under this proposed mm -hmm. scheme would not be able to vote on school budgets or school directors or it would any, not. and it would not because we can't, we can't impose our decision on the town of Roxbury. So it would be only those things that are strictly Montpelier. Mayor, City Council, Planning Commission, Recreation Board, Justices of the Peace, ballot items, shall we? Yeah, but we can't do Justice of the Peace. We can't? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, they're not Justices of the Peace. I mean, it, it is a strictly limited group for which they would be able to vote. Okay. I, for some reason, I thought when we first talked about it, we were talking about school districts as well. But well, if maybe we still have just the Montpelier Maybe that was when we were talking statewide. Burlington, you should be able to do, because it's the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah. uh, Representative Harrison, going to your point, uh, um, a school district election is a local election, <laughs> um, and therefore it's not a constitutional office. It's not subject to constitutional voting qualifications, but I think the language, as Representative Kitzmiller was uh, referring to, the language of, is it, is it 207? Yeah. Thanks. Um, In section 15. Thank you, Tucker. Um, I think the language is set up here, and as Tucker pointed out, in section 1503, that if it involves something other than a city question or city office, um, 
the legal resident non-citizen voters would only get the city question, candidate questions. So not not the mixed Roxbury election. But they could if the school district asked for that. If you enacted a law to allow uh, non-citizen legal residents to vote in all local elections, for example, then they would be able to vote in a school district election. Okay. But right now, the language of the charter as it's set up is really just focusing. But, uh, yeah, no, thank you for thank clarifying you. that. I'm getting confused because we had some discussion about doing this statewide. Correct. And in that way, it would apply to the school. Yes. Thank you. But Madam Chair, if I can just go back to this checklist issue. Um, this was the other statute that we discussed earlier, which is that <coughs> this is the requirement at least 30 days before any local elector, any local election or primary general election for the town clerk to post copies of the checklist. So here they're posted in town. I think in practice, you can they can get swiped. Um, but otherwise, it says the town clerk makes available a copy of the checklist to different people. However, I think I defer back to the director and how this law will be administered. Um, although this provides that the list can be, the town checklist can be provided to people upon request here in subsection C, then my next question though is, how does that work with our statewide voter checklist statute with the prohibition on public agencies being prohibited from giving a portion of the municipal portion of the statewide voter checklist to foreign governments or federal agencies. I just don't know how those two work in practice. Oh, yes. I think that the language in 2154 limits that language. Thanks. So anybody else can request it, but not federal agencies. A federal agency could come and sneak it off the bulletin board at the supermarket. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But we can't stop that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Bob, did you yes. have a question? Not one that made a whole lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another uh, topic to take up at 10 o'clock. I think what we should do is see whether we can um, either get the Tacoma Park, Maryland, um, representative on the phone or perhaps exchange emails and, and ask the question of what they've done to ensure uh, the ballot security um, or the uh, checklist security. Um, and we can come back to this a little bit later. Uh, so for now, I would suggest that you all take a quick stride down the hallway and be back here by 10 for another bill introduction. Um, do a, a brief introduction of your bill. Great, thank you. My name is Emily Kornheiser. I'm a representative from Brattleboro. And I appreciate you taking the time to hear about this bill in the midst of everything else that's been going on this week and how few that we have in committee. Um, I hope everyone in the room can agree that voting is important. Um, that's why most of us are here, I think. And we have unparalleled access here in Vermont um, to voting. We have very few restrictions on how people can vote, who can vote, what voting ID looks like. And we also have an incredibly long period of time available to us to vote. We have some of the earliest voting in the country. So I was really surprised to see that while we've had an increase in absentee ballots, we haven't actually seen an increase in voting rates. And so when I was first looking at this data in Vermont, I was assuming that this was because, you know, Vermont had managed to not turn the curve, but at least stayed flat while the rest of the country's voting rate had probably gone down. That was just sort of the assumption I was having because we've done all of this great work to expand voting access. Um, but in fact, we've actually stayed slightly above, but pretty much on the same rhythm as national voting, which really surprised me. I'm not sure how many other people that might surprise. So while in Vermont we see sort of a low of 41% folks voting um, and a high of 69.8, it really seems to not have much of a rhythm beyond you know, presidential and non-presidential, and that's how you'll see those spikes there. So I would like to increase voting participation. I hope that many of you here would like to do that. And so I think that 
Over the last 50 odd years, despite the many efforts at both voter access and voter suppression, little has changed. And I have a hypothesis um, based on the door knocking that I did in the last election that many Vermonters have no idea an election is happening. That people's lives are very busy, trying to just make ends meet, take care of their kids, deal with day-to-day -day life, that it just goes right over or under the radar. Um, and so I think by making an election day a state holiday, which this bill asks us to do, we can test the hypothesis that perhaps if people just knew that election day was happening, we'd have more people voting. And the way you do that, I think generally brings attention to something, is for some celebration as a holiday gives. So um, this bill asks us to take the next step for awareness and celebration. But our, our values clearly on the table. Vermont, I think, loves democracy, maybe even more than other states. Um, and so we can have the kind of school lessons that we have when we have a state's holiday. Maybe we could have autumn barbecues. Um, but people would have a chance to pay more attention to it. <coughs> I know the next step that people are probably asking about is um, a day off connected to this. It was not my intent in this bill to interfere with the collective bargaining process. And it is my understanding, as I was advised by Legislative Council and the BSEA, that a state holiday does not immediately and automatically create a day off for state employees. However, well, and that means that this bill, if passed, would not cost anything substantial in terms of you know, days off for employees. But it would bring necessary attention to this important day. And it's my hope that by enacting this bill, we would give um, sort of a material object to bargaining units to talk about, as well as folks who are not part of a union to have a negotiation or a conversation with their employers about what a day off would look like on this really important day. And maybe people wouldn't have a day off, but because it was a state holiday, they would have a party at lunch to talk about it, you know, or it would just be part of the conversation. So first bill, no, I'm not supposed to say it's a simple one, but really just hoping to bring more attention to this very important day. Jim and Mike. Is um, town meet, isn't town meeting day sort of a holiday mm -hmm. in March? Mm -hmm. yes. How do you explain that on town meeting we might get 23% turnout um, and it's a holiday? I mean, I, I mean, if that was really what helped, mm -hmm. it hasn't helped. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I would say is many town meetings don't happen on town meeting day. Mine certainly doesn't. Um, and many folks are still working. The difference between um, town meeting day and the general or primary election is that you have extensive time to vote in advance. So I think people don't go to town meeting often because they don't have time to go to town meeting on town meeting day at the time town meeting is. But by knowing about an election, you have the time leading up to it to vote. So it's not necessarily for me about bringing people to polls on election day, it's about people knowing about election day well enough to vote at another time that's available to them. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I voted early on town meeting yeah. because I had to be at another town yeah. where I can't vote. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm just, I mean, I, I, mean, there I look at your chart and, and it's, we've done a lot of things. I, know. I mean, today there's absolutely no excuse uh, for not voting because you've got 45 days. You can vote early. It, you don't have to have a note from your doctor that you can't get out of your home. You can just vote early. Um, so. I mean, I think there are other reasons why people don't vote. I think a lot of people have um, seen elections come and go and their lives don't change, so they think none of it matters. Yeah. Um, I think people don't vote because we don't have really like exciting competitive primary elections in a lot of cases, and so people aren't brought into the process early enough. I thought my primary um, was pretty I exciting. think mine was <laughs> um, Me against me, I mean. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> just what the outcome of the week. <laughs> but I think with a lot of state holidays, schools bring in an element of education to a state holiday, and I think by maybe um, if this was sort of integrated into curriculum, 
because it was a state holiday, then maybe we'd be building voters earlier. Like I said, it really is a hypothesis. Mike? Thanks for coming in, and thanks for the idea. I, I agree it's important to help produce this stuff. And I wonder if uh, you'd be amenable to putting that holiday on a weekend, changing elections the weekend. Um, I think that would be confusing given when the national Because um, I think it's important that we stay within the national conversation, and that's on changing the whole. Yeah, thing. yeah, it's an interesting idea. Hmm. Other questions, JP. Mm, well, I, I initially had a couple few for you, but you you explained those fairly well, and my my big concern or was the actual cost to the state if the state was to give state employees the day off. It would be the day off most likely would pay and that would be thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the same same goes for individual businesses. That could be thousands of dollars. And it, it got in my conflicted union contract. But you very clearly took care of that. <clears throat> I'm just wondering I personally would prefer and I support your your bill where you're trying to get recognition for the election day. That's fine. That's that's a very good idea. I like that. But I just wonder if maybe the bill could include something saying that this this is not necessarily a day off with pay. If that's a possibility. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because I just think a lot of people seeing that they're gonna Say they're going to think the same thing I did when I first read it, going, oh, my God, there's another state holiday. What's that cost now? Or, or a business can now like to let all my employees off. There's now thousands and thousands of dollars we're going to lose. And again, the unions are jumping right on that, too, as well. So I don't know. It just food for thought. Are you, can I ask you a question about your question? I'm sorry? Can I ask you a question about your question? Absolutely. Are you concerned about that, sort of how it would play out on the floor here, or how it would <coughs> look to the average citizen? Because I don't, I personally I, don't think that people read our laws very often. You're probably <laughs> correct. You are probably correct. I'm doing <laughs> this, but I certainly I didn't right. read very many <laughs> laws before. You are probably, and, and I think these, the, if that was explained on a house floor, that would play out fine with the, with the house floor. We would understand that, of course. But I just wondered if when people see that, they, they read that we now have a new state holiday and they're going to think the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that might, uh, might irritate a lot of people. Just, yeah. just, just food for thought, the wording of it. John and then Nelson? Um, so just looking at state holidays that employees do get off, um, the list is exactly consistent with the list of legal holidays. Um, so if we did add this, um, there might be an effort to bargain for this being an additional holiday. So there could be a potential cost to the state. Yes. My understanding is that when this has happened previously, holidays were swapped. And I'm not in any way interested in getting into which holidays should be swapped. That is a morass that should be left for someone else. But um, that is my understanding that generally holidays are swapped. <laughs> yeah. And as a former state employee, Bennington Battle Day was my favorite thing that happened all year. <laughs> 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 out of nowhere. Yeah. 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 Get more voters involved is a great thing, uh, and creating another holiday to, might be the way to do this. But I don't know. There's a holiday just about for everything, about every day that goes on. So how do you plan to promote this? Because you're right, we do important work here, but people usually don't read our bills. How would you get that message out? And, and actually, so people, because that's the goal, is to get a message out so people can vote. Do you have a method or something you're thinking of doing? Um, two ideas. One, the Secretary of State um, was interested in this, especially if we sort of um, disregard the union conversation from it. Um, 
and has done tremendous work to increase voting access here, and so I think would probably promote this. Um, and you know, maybe work with the grocers association to figure out like what the like food for voting day is. You know, like they have the avocados out for the Super Bowl and the chicken wings and like. So what is the what is this voting food? Is it cider donuts? I don't know. And they'll have a little display, and everyone will be like, oh look, the cider donuts are on sale. I'm gonna go vote tomorrow. I don't know. What <laughs> Other questions? Thank you for bringing that forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We have another one, right? We have one more. Jim, you're so ahead of the game. Nicely done. I'm sorry, I was behind this this morning. Who's behind? Oh. No. <laughs> I'll just wear the strings. I see. We're going to start lobbing these things back and forth across the table. I'm on the head of that end of the table. That end would have Yeah. Did you hear about my morning? I was juggling um, my cup of coffee and my bag down the stairs to get in my car this morning, and coffee went straight down. Yeah. All over all the things I was carrying. You know, it could be worse. It could have been a cream filled donut. It could have been. And I could have been already here, in which case I wouldn't have been able to go back and change. <laughs> so, yeah, I seem to have every excuse in the book for so what running late in the morning. Are you doing? This morning it was a full cup. Right, choice voting. Yeah, what's four, the number? Four, 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 four. You just have to keep tapping a four. I got it right here. Do we want the bill or do you want section? Uh, leave it leave it up there and they can decide. I, there's three oh. people coming. Um, or right. three people have been invited. Are they all confirmed? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Where are they? Should I get them? Yes. Rob's got just, no time just, to wait. <laughs> wow. Well, we're busy okay. committee. Um, you got Laura Sibilia. Robin was here earlier. Right? He's not coming back. Why am I? Well, they're both in the same committee, so we could rise the quorum. And Randall's just across the hallway, so you can try him as well. Yeah, they're waiting for you. I wonder if they decided who's going to do the speaking. Aha, who's sending the new guy? No, I'm not first. <laughs> So, thank you, Madam Chair. We have how many minutes? Well, we have judicial retention. We'll hear so, the bells ringing. Okay, great. If we might start first with this one minute video, um, just to kind of frame where we're at, I think that would be helpful. Get a little arrow. There we go. Pick your favorite color. Rank your choice of voting by Instead of voting for just one, <coughs> you get to rank your top three. Well, purple is the best, but if I can't have purple, I want blue. And if neither of those wins, I guess I can leave the bridge. Now, let's count up everybody's votes. <coughs> Under rank choice voting rules, it's not enough just to get the most votes. You need a majority. More than 50% of the votes. Purple's ahead, but it has only <laughs> seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. So we eliminate the color in the last place. Sorry, Orange Hands. We're going to your second choice. Two more for green. One for purple. But no color has 11 votes yet. Still no majority. Bye-bye, blue. One more for purple. Four for green. And we have a winner. The right choice voting way. Okay. So, uh, 
I'm not sure which one of us is going to start. So uh, did you want to start at a high level? Like, why? Well, I thought I was going last, but I can okay. start. You want to go? Go ahead. I can, okay. I can do the, do it. the why. Great. Good. And, uh, first rehearsal here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, as you can see, the process needs to be ironed out. Um, so uh, I'll start with, uh, for the record, Representative Robin Chestnut Tangerman. I did not say that this morning, so I'll say it again, mm -hmm. Representative mm -hmm. Robin Chestnut Tangerman. Um, and the, uh, you just saw a, a brief demonstration of how uh, ranked choice voting works, but I want to just talk a little bit about why. And the, the first presidential election that I voted in was 1980. It was Reagan, Carter, and John Anderson. And that's when I first became aware of the, the issue of when my grandfather said to me, I'm going to cast my vote in a way that I can't um, defend logically. He wanted to vote for Anderson, but what it meant to him was he was wasting his vote. And at that point, I started thinking, there has to be a better way to do this. Because I mean, what, why do we vote? We vote to express the will of the, the body politic. And so the question I ask is, is the way that we practice that really the most reflective of, of what the will of, of the people is? And I believe that it's not, because we've all been in a situation before of, having, of not being able to vote for the person that we really want to vote for because we feel like we are throwing away our vote, and so we settle for choosing the least offensive of the, of the remaining candidates. Um, and to me, ranked choice voting resolves that problem, where you really can vote for the person you want, and if that person uh, is eliminated early, your vote still counts toward the, toward the eventual uh, winning candidate. And I think the reason I think that it's important is because with multiple candidates, the, the winning margins get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so when somebody can win an election with a plurality of 35%, that is not anywhere close to the majority of the voters. And I think if your vote, if the votes are retabulated to reflect second and third choices, it actually builds a greater consensus behind the winning candidate rather than, than fostering more division. I think it actually builds support for the winning candidate. Yeah. In the interest of time. Yes, <laughs> in the interest of time. So we have a bill that we have brought forward to you, H444, uh, which is modeled after, uh, it is modeled after uh, Maine's legislation that uh, was passed and actually used in the last election. There was cause for um, using instant runoff voting in one of their congressional elections. The candidate had not won a majority of the vote. Um, they did run through this, and uh, the actual result at the end of the day changed um, because the candidate who had not run won the majority of the vote when you went through actually did not end up getting the majority of the vote. So we won the most votes, but when you do instant runoff voting and then see who has the, you then retally dropping out your bottom person. So that was litigated and the system was upheld. Uh, one of the things that we want to make sure to um, talk with you all about is uh, on April 4th, and we've been talking with your chair and also uh, government operations downstairs, we are uh, hosting a public info session, and we will have uh, Kyle Bailey from Maine, who is a national consultant on ranked choice voting, but had been heavily involved, has been heavily involved in that system, coming to do uh, a public info session, uh, 5.30 downstairs, and we're hoping that there will be some time to have him come in and talk with the committee and talk about how this has kind of played out uh, in Maine. And so we've posted a, an overview of the bill on your on your website as well. And Randall, I think I'll dish to you. So for the record, Randall Zog from Barnard. Um, so ranked choice voting, the way that I look at it, is another aspect of voter enfranchisement. Um, so I, I see it as connected to a, the same piece that uh, voter registration drives, uh, motor voter bills, uh, automatic voter registration, uh, depending on how you feel about it, uh, pushing back against uh, voter ID laws, 
depending on your point of view there. Early voting, absentee voting, all of these are, are means for making our elections as inclusive and fair as possible and trying to get the best read on the electorate that we can get. And the more people you bring in, the better representation you have of what the will of the people is. Ranked choice voting, I hear I'm already on the bell. Um, ranked choice voting is just another, um, another piece of that because it says you have three different choices and I'll use a really ridiculous one of bagels, right? And there's people who really love everything bagels. There's some people who really don't like them. And there's some people who really like poppy seed bagels, but some people may not really like them. But everybody's kind of okay with uh, plain bagel. And so if everybody's okay with that, that's the consensus point of view that would, would reveal itself in ranked choice voting. And one of the big arguments that people make for ranked choice voting is it, depend, it tends to moderate discussion as well, because when you're competing against someone whose votes might be yours in second place, you're not going to serve yourself very well to trash them during the election, because you want their votes. And so it's a way, again, of just getting the best articulation of where the electorate is at. So uh, again, not the guy identified myself for the record, Laura Sebelia uh, from Dover for the record. Um, the, this bill at a high level right now requires ranked choice voting for all primary elections except the presidential primary and in general elections for the office of U.S. Senator and U.S. House. Certainly that could be expanded, but that's what passed in Maine. And I would uh, call the committee's attention to a pretty um, healthy uh, effort underway in Massachusetts um, and really in a number of places throughout, throughout the country. Um, there's been discussion about the presidential primary, um, and I think there are all different different uh, discussions that we could follow down this path. For me, I think that this is so important um, in terms of the tenor of campaigns um, and reflecting the actual will of the voters. So as Randall um, was articulating, really having folks focus on the issues and having to compete for a first or second place really, I think, pushes more on focusing on the issues as opposed to being able to kind of stand on your side and just trash the other side. You really have to talk about what you believe in and how you're going to help um, constituents. And if I may add that uh, although presidential primaries are not included in this bill, <clears throat> I think they're really a great illustration that in the last election there were how many Republican candidates, 17, something like that. And so in the primaries, winning margins were very small. You could win a primary with 20%. This time around, it's going to be the Democrats in the same boat. Yeah. So it's nonpartisan in that way. Um, and it, I think, again, is, is best reflective of rather than winning with 20%, it keeps recalculating until somebody has a, a majority vote. <laughs> Rob, Bob, Jim, JP. Well, <clears throat> This may be a longer question to answer, but what, what's the downside to this in that there's, uh, for instance, like I know there's communities that try to, they don't now, like Burlington, uh, there feels at least initially at first glance that there's something about it that could be manipulated. And it just feels, what, what could be the downsides? So, Honestly, I don't see any downsides. Um, I think the uh, education um, folks feel like this is really difficult to understand. It's really not. Um, part of the reason that we came forward with just the main proposals right now is because we have something that actually has been enacted that we can look to, that we can point to, and say, here's how it works. We're completely aware of the Burlington situation. Um, we know that this legislation passed, um, both the House and the Senate previously. It was vetoed. Uh, by the governor and then enacted in Burlington. It worked in Burlington. People did not like the candidate that it ended up um, electing uh, after the fact. But it actually did work. So. I will actually point out a downside. I know, but uh, it's, it's a little counterintuitive. I mean, the way that we've conducted elections in a lot of ways, it's a little counterintuitive because you say, oh, this is the person that got the most votes. And we've, we've sort of become sort of uh, used to that as, a, and so for some people you have to sort of, you have to get past this idea of like this is, this is the way that we've always done it. However, there are other instances where people have done ranked choice voting, like when you go out to buy donuts for your friends, you essentially engage in the kind of ranked choice voting anyway, so you just have to kind of shift the frame of reference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm sorry, there's a side joke with Krispy Kreme here. We're going to bring some in and we can right. rank choice. Bob, Jim, JP. So is, is there any downside cost-wise in terms of hardware? Uh, we actually met with the Secretary of State, and there, uh, actually, the proposal, it's possible that this aligns very well with planned um, replacement and enhancement of um, voting machines in the state. So transition-wise, it's here, not And, and also, um, something I think this committee would be interested in, Representative Kelly Paella, who is a town clerk, um, is engaged in this. We expect that town clerks um, would, you know, be deeply involved in um, this legislation. In, in response to the, the cost question right now, um, printing ballots for the uh, elections costs about $80,000 per party. Um, you would still print ballots, but if there's a runoff, you don't have to print new ballots. So potential cost savings there. And I agree with your assessment of Burlington's experience. One minute, Jim. So um, we're all concerned about voter turnout. And I guess um, what you're doing, I know we've done it a certain way, so anytime you change that kind of raises a lot of questions. But we're, we're certainly handicapped uh, by the state constitution in that you know, the governor's office, the lieutenant governor's office, if they don't get a majority, has to come to their instant runoff as us. Um, so, and then you can't, you're not doing the, for the presidential, I'm, do, are you worried about having different systems for different offices, and therefore, <coughs> are we confusing people more than we seem to do sometimes? Um, and there, will that have an impact on voter turnout? So sometimes we do things the whole, the whole shebang, and sometimes we do things um, incrementally. And so what we proposed is an incremental change, um, you know, something that is statewide and easy to start getting our heads around. And and Maine does it, you know, did it the same way. They didn't have problems. And there's also Minnesota, say, where and Minneapolis, where municipally they do elections that way, but at the state level they don't. And so the voters are able to manage. In San Francisco, same thing. They, at the municipal level, they do rank choice voting, but they don't do it statewide. So, okay, thank you. Okay. So it is 10:30. We're going to need to head down to the floor now.